So uh, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Paul for organizing this wonderful workshop. I'm Lu Miguel, and I'm a fifth year grad student at UC Berkeley with Eric Newscomen. Today I'm going to talk to you uh, talk a little bit about the wave function optimization uh, algorithms that we implement in QMC pack. So to start with, I'll start uh, with the motivation of doing wave function optimization. So suppose we live in this nice and simple world where electrons do not interact with each other. And then I represent the entire Hilbert space of non-interacting electrons by this. And by, we, all, we all know physics and we all, we all know chemistry. We know that the exact ground state or exact like functions of the non-interacting electrons, uh, non-interacting electrons can be represented by just a single slip determinant. The, uh, the anti-symmetrized product of one particle, uh, one particle functions, and we call it orbitals. And supposedly, supposedly, uh, this is the exact growth state of the Hamiltonian that you care about in this non-interacting picture. And then you want to get to this uh, this this red star. This uh, the orbital is represented by this by star, which is the uh, the growth the exact growth state of the Hamiltonian that you care about. And you, you and the first step you do is you you make a gap to the orbitals. Suppose this gap is represented by this purple dot. And unless we are really really lucky, the gap is not going to be lie on top of the the star, because uh, you don't really know what the orbitals are but inside the star. All you know is that the, by physics, the uh, exact ground state is a uh, decided slight slate determinant, but we do not know what the orbitals are okay, uh, of the slight of the slate determinant. So that we need to use numerical algorithm, numerical optimization techniques to actually drag us from this purple dot to the uh, red star, to the exact ground state. And of course, in reality, we're not living in a world where, like, where electrons do not interact with each other. We live in a world where like, electrons do interact with each other. So we use approximate wave functions on those. And in reality, we, it's very possible that you will never get to the exact uh, the red star. But uh, with a good wave function and a good wave function optimization techniques, the hope, the hope is that you can get as close as you want to the uh, red star. So the next question that we want to ask is that I really do not care about the wave function. I'm a chemist. I care about what can we compute once we have a wave function. A wave function is a complicated mathematical quantity that people may care or may not care. But the thing is that we can compute a lot of quantities once we have a good wave function. So first, the very straightforward thing that we can compute is energy. And of course, we have energy. We have natural energy surfaces. You have natural energy surfaces. You can compute barrier heights. And with barrier heights, we can further compute the reaction rate. That's something the chemists really care about. And also, uh, if you compute the energy difference between different electronic degrees of freedom, different energy surfaces, you immediately get the excitation energy. And, of all, and if you have enough of the excitation energy, you can construct your spectrum. And you can hand your spectrum, your optical, assume the optical uh, absorption spectrum to an experiment, and you can actually compare it with their experiment results. And hopefully they match, and they can really use it to interpret, it, to interpret their experimental results. Okay, so we have we can we can get energy. That's pretty good. Kinetic energy surfaces, very high reaction rate, spectrums. Another thing we can compute is forces, which is nothing but the uh, the gradient of the nuclear positions. Once you have a kinetic uh, energy surface, once you have a good wave function, you can compute forces. If you have forces, you can do a lot of things. We can first of all, you can do a geometry optimizations, which to get the uh, optimal structure of the system that you care about, and you can also do you can also even do molecular dynamic, I mean, natural molecular dynamic simulations to really capture or describe some of the non equilibrium uh, properties of the system. And if, in cases where multiple electronic degrees of freedom matter, in cases where born Oppenheimer approximation break down, uh, uh, such, as, such, like, such as the in conical intersections or a wide crossing regions, and then with a wave function that can, uh, that can get us accurate. Uh, accurate Planetary energy surfaces and then the non-adiabatic coupling matrix elements and forces. We can do non-adiabatic dynamic simulations to uh, resolve a lot of mysteries that people see in like large light harvesting experiments. So yeah, so the table message is with a better wave function, we can really do whatever we want. Okay, so we haven't talked about how we're going to drag our wave function from the crude, very presumably random initial gas to the uh, state to the exact close to exact eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And so the, the tool that we're going to use to drag our wave function to that state is called the variational principle. And there are different variational principles for ground state and a 
everyone, everybody, is nothing but an energy functional. And you can actually show that this quantity function of the wave function is, is actually lower bounded by the exact wrong state. So suppose you start your wave function here, this, uh, from this, uh, this blue bar, and then this is your energy, uh, this is a discretized energy spectrum. Suppose you start a wave function here, and you optimize this quantity, and supposedly you do not get trapped in any of this local minimum or settle point, and suppose your wave function is accurate or flexible enough to actually describe the ground state. Upon optimization, upon convergence of this energy, you will, the wave function will be representing the exact ground state of the Hamiltonian. Of course, this technique doesn't work for doesn't work for excited state because excited state doesn't have the lowest energy in the energy spectrum. So we switch to this excited state variation principle, which contains now it's not the energy. This contains a it's a kind of weird quantity. It contains a free parameter omega here. So suppose you put omega in between uh, in between the uh, so. You can, actually, you can actually rigorously prove that this quantity, the global minimum of, the quanti of this quantity is actually uh, the, the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian whose energy is immediately above the omega matter that you set. So suppose you put omega in between the second, in between energy of the second and the third excited states. And suppose you start a wave function here, to this, uh, this is the blue bar, and suppose you do not get trapped in any of the local minimum or saddle point of during your optimization and your wave function is accurate or flexible enough to describe the states. And then once you start to op optimize this quantity, if this ground state optimization, they will just fall back to the ground state. But because we use this, this one, the, uh, the, the, the global minimum of this quantity is the third excited state, the wave function will be dragged to the third excited state. Yeah, so this is, this, this is the ground state and then the excited state variation principle that we're going to use. All right. so. Uh, Picture is uh, simple and nice, and we you will also see that this quant the wave function is really exact, and you can show that as you if you put omega on top of the uh, of the eigen uh, of the eigen energy of the uh, of the energy of the exact energy, this quantity will diverge once your wave function approach the exact eigen state. But in in reality, this never happens because we do not have the exact wave function. In reality, what we found is that if you Compute this big omega as a function of small omega for different excited states. We will find that instead of diverging at some point, they all, they, uh, they, all, they both have this global uh, they both have a global minimum at the point where the uh, where the small omega is equal to the energy of the wave function minus the subtracted by the standard deviation of the local energy. So this gives us a kind of a rule of thumb how you choose a omega. I introduced this parameter omega. In the previous slides, but I haven't made any comments on how to choose an omega. So, so this slide shows that the way you choose the omega, the rule of sum of choosing an omega is just to take the omega as an initial energy. You compute the initial energy of your randomly gas wave function, and you also compute the standard deviation of the local energy, and you subtract energy, and you sub subtract uh, the energy by the standard deviation, and then use that as your omega matter to target the states. All right, so. Uh, uh, let's now talk about the uh, the optimization method that's being implemented in QMC time, the uh, the linear method. So the linear method, the idea behind the linear method is actually pretty simple. Suppose you have a wave function and it's parameterized by this set of parameters p, and then suppose supposedly you uh, well, suppose suppose that you are already close enough to the to the ground to the uh, to the global minimum that you care that you want to the exact eigenstate. state. So. Because of that, uh, because of that assumption, the uh, parameter change of the of the wave function parameter p, so delta p, should be small. Because delta p is small, we can actually linearize the wave function through a first order Taylor expansion. And so once we do that, we can plot this linearized uh, psi p plus delta p into either the energy functional or the excited state target functional, depending on which uh, which state we want to get. And once we do that, we have this these expressions for the energy and the target function. And we can actually take derivatives of both quantities with respect to delta p, and then set the derivative to zero. Once we do that, we end up with these two equations. These, they look differently in uh, the first class, but once you uh, inspect it closely, you will find that they are both in the form of a generalized eigenvalue problem uh, you, with a different uh, Hamiltonian H tilde, Hamiltonian matrix, and an overlap matrix S tilde. So then you 
you just need to call your famous, your, your LaTeX routine to actually solve the generalized eigenvalue problem, to actually get the, uh, to get the delta P to parameter change. Once you have delta P, you can perform a uh, uh, inverse Taylor expansion to update your wave function parameters so that you can uh, get an updated wave function. And then you do, a, uh, and then you will have a, to get an updated wave function. And then this consists of one step of linear method. So in summary, the one step of linear methods has its four sub-steps. The first one, the so first step is that you build the, you, you build the uh, H tilde, the Hamiltonian, and S tilde, the overlap matrices. But the second step is, is you solve the generalized eigenvalue problem get your, uh, to get the parameter change. And the third step is you update the wave function, get uh, update the wave function. And then the, uh, the, the last step is to check whether you have converged with, in terms of the energy or the uh, excessive target function value. And once we have, conver once we have converged uh, through some threshold, then you're done. If you're not converged, then you go back to step one to review the H and S, H tilde and S tilde matrix uh, using the update the wave function. All right, so, uh, so this is kind of an idea or most straightforward implementation of linear method, but if you actually implement things that way, I'm pretty sure it won't work because you have to take care of the so-called step size control. The assumptions that, uh, that I use as I made to derive the aforementioned linear method is based on that the parameter change of the wave function should be small. You're already closing up to the basin that you, uh, that you want, and the parameter change should be small, and the first order Taylor expansion should be valid. But in a lot of cases, if you start with really bad wave functions, so pretty far from the uh, global, global minimum that you want to get to, that assumption, that, is, that assumption is basically uh, not going to work. It's the parameter change ought to be large, and the first order Taylor expansion should break down. Because of that, we have we really had to control our step size so that we're not making a huge change in the wave function so that linear mass of, uh, uh, the, the, the Taylor expansion breaks. In order to do that, we uh, use a modified Hamiltonian. We add two additional matrices to our uh, to our bare Hamiltonian uh, Hamiltonian matrix as A and B, and then both are uh, multiplied by scalar alpha and beta. So let's talk about the A matrix first. The A matrix is a simple one here. It's nothing but a, a diagonal matrix, except that you, uh, if you look at this, you'll find it's diagonal. It's one on the uh, on the diagonal, but but zero for the uh, for the rest, and also zero for the zero for the one one elements of the matrix. So because the one one elements of the linear mass matrix is corresponds to the current value, the current energy value, or the current excitation target function value of the current wave function. So what does this this diagonal matrix A do? Is that is it add is this A matrix is going to add a constant penalty to the to the uh, to the derivative directions of the wave function. Suppose this A matrix, this alpha value is infinite, then the, then this, this this modified uh, Hamiltonian will be like some final value at the one at the, the one one elements and then infinite on the diagonal. And then what it means that is that the optimizer sees that going to any of the directions of the wave function is going to increase the either the energy or the target excited the target function value by an infinite amount so that it will not move the states in the current wave function. So that the step size in that case is a hard zero. But we do not want the hard zero. We want the control step size to be small, so we add a finite finite penalty here uh, by this alpha value, so that uh, the larger the alpha is, the smaller the step size is. But we still have additional uh, beta there. What does beta do? So the the alpha penalty is kind of like a uniform penalty for every single uh, wave function parameters. But we kind of don't want every, uh, the uniform penalty for every single wave function parameters. We want we want this. We penalize wave function uh, variable directions specifically based on their own properties. So some wave function, so the wave function parameters are not the same, right? The Jasper factors, the uh, the CI vectors, or the orbital parameters are different, and they presumably they have different uh, uh, they have different derivatives and the different uh, thickness. So going to going to <clears throat> so that uh, this B matrix here, the uh, mathematical form is pretty complicated. But the take-home message is that it's kind of, it's going to penalize each wave function directions based on its own thickness. So if if the wave function direction uh, on uh, if, the wave, if the wave function direction on certain on certain variables is kind of steep. Basically, which means that uh, going to that direction is going to change, uh, change your wave function by a significant amount, then the linear method is going to add a large penalty to that direction. So it prohibits a large change in that, in that uh, direction. And with the wave function direction is more gentle, the changing a large amount of that direction is not going to change the wave function by a lot, then the, then the linear method is going to be more ambitious in 
to have a large to uh, to have a large change and a small penalty to that direction. All right, so that's uh, what the B matrix is doing. So uh, I haven't talked about how to choose the shift matter. So how to choose the alpha and beta matter. If you choose a too large of shift, presumably your optimizer is not going to do it. It's not going to do anything. It's going to stay in the current wave function and optimize, not optimize at all. And if you, if you choose a too small alpha and alpha and beta, and then the uh, presumably the optimizer will just fail because it tends to make, make large moves, and then it, uh, the first order hit extension breaks down. The code is more uh, the code is smarter than that. We're including the so-called adaptive shift. So the adaptive shift automatically uh, adjusts the shift value during optimization. So it, all you need to do is to set initial alpha and beta, and then the code will generate the small set of shift alpha divided by four beta divided by five divided by four. Median shift, which is nothing but alpha beta, and large shift, which is alpha beta multiplied by four. And with this three uh, different set of shifts. We solved three, three different set of generalized eigenvalue problems with the modified Hamiltonian. And once we solved that and updated our wave function based on the parameter update, we use quality sensing to compare the wave function, the updated wave function, uh, either the energy or the excited target function value based on three different shifts. And if, if the small shift wins, if the small shift is sensible and gets to a lowest energy or the, uh, target state or the uh, excited target function value, then the code, uh, then the optimizer is going to lower the shift so that it minimizes the next step is going to start with a small, even smaller shift than alpha and beta. If the large, if the median shift wins and minimizes, then the optimizer is going to keep the shift, keep the shift, shift constant. And if the large shift wins, then the, uh, the optimizer is going to increase the shift value. So what it does is that if the small shift means a wins, that means that uh, you are already closing up to the basin, then the code is being more ambitious in making a move to the wave function. And if the large shift wins, that means we are pretty far from the, uh, from the minimum, then the code, then the optimizer is being more cautious to actually, uh, uh, to actually not, move, not move the wave function by a lot, to actually make, make uh, small moves at each step. So, uh, so that's, that's very nice. But so how many, how many parameters can we optimize with the linear method that I just described? I would say that at most a few thousand. It's because compared to like uh, in deterministic quantum chemistry, you know, like in CI or couple cluster where the number of variables in the wave function can well, the wave function can scale up to like millions, this is not this this is nothing, right? This uh, few thousand parameters optimization really uh, limits the capability of linear method wave function optimization. Because there's a of memory bottleneck of the linear method. The memory, the memory bottleneck is actually pretty easily understood, and uh, it can be very easily understood. Just look at the, uh, the generalized eigenvalue problem, and you will immediately see why there's a memory bottleneck. Because of this H tilde and S tilde matrices, and we have to build the matrices and then store it on memory explicitly for each for every single process. These matrices has a, a dimension of number of variables times number of variables, and if you plot it number of variables as a fun, uh, if you plot the, the memory that you, you need to have per process as a number of variables here, and then suppose every single variable is stored in doubles, you will see that with a hundred thousand of wave function parameters, the amount of memory that you, you will need to have to store these two matrices on one single process is 160 gigabytes. And we all know that Intel process Intel Core uh, have only a few gigabytes of memory. So there's no way you can store these matrices on a single process. So that, that limits your ability to optimize to up to like a few thousand wave function parameters using the standard linear method. So to, to deal with this problem, we implemented the so-called block linear method in QMC hack. So the block linear method is kind of hard to explain, but I will try my best. The very true idea of block linear method is that instead of dealing with this initial, this dense, large, dense matrix, the we uh, run out of memory if you just do it. We divide our, our variables into blocks. And suppose if we can make something that the, uh, the off block, the off block diagonal element, the couplings between the, uh, the variables in different blocks are, are zero. And then you can, instead of uh, dealing with this initial large matrices, you can, just, uh, you can just deal with these three small matrices. So now we have like six uh, parameters are divided into three blocks. Instead of Solving a six by six matrix, I'll, all I need to do is solve three two by two matrices, and then get the eigenvectors, and then I can count them together. This eigenvector, this uh, this this one will be the exact eigenvectors 
of this initial dense, uh, dense matrix. But in reality, this is not always true. The all broad diagonal elements are not always zero, so we have to have a way to take account for the uh, for the non-zero for the coupling between variables in different blocks. So that's the idea of a block linear method. So start from this are starting from this uncorrelated blocks, and we take this block, for example. And this block is built in the basis of these two of these two vectors and the, uh, of these two vectors. These two vectors are the uh, parameters of the wave function inside the block. These these two, uh, these, yeah, these two parameters. And then certainly there are four different parameters, four different parameters that live outside the block that we have to consider. Instead of treating them as four different independent wave function update directions, we treat them as a as one single wave function update directions. So instead of dealing with this, instead of dealing with four directions, we deal with only one direction. And that, that direction comes from the old, the previous wave function update directions of these variables. So this is kind of a crude way of treat of of, do, of treating the uh, uh, of treating the interblock coupling. Basically means that uh, instead of uh, have the resolution of seeing these four as four different directions, we see these four as one large cross green direction. So instead of have four bases, we only have one here. And then using these three, uh, using these three bases, we build a correlated box, which take into some of the uh, take, take into some of the interblock coupling, but not all of them. So this would be like an approximate way. Of course, if you add enough of this, of this, uh, this, uh, this previous update directions, and then you will eventually resolve the difference between these four directions, and then you will go back, you will go, uh, you will regress back to the standard, uh, standard linear method without its blocking stuff. Okay, so we have the correlated blocks, and then we can, uh, we do it for all the blocks, and solve this solid generalized eigenvalue problem for each single, for each block, and then keep a few uh, eigenvectors, use them to be, to have, to build, uh, to form a new basis, to build our new Hamiltonian in that basis. And then we can solve the generalized eigenvalue problem in this new basis. This, this, this basis is much smaller than the basis that we start with. And then uh, to get the, uh, so again, we can get the eigenvector, and then we can transform this, uh, this eigenvector back to the basis that we start with, the full basis of the wave function parameters to form a uh, approximate eigenvector of the uh, initial dense matrix. All right, so this is kind of tedious a lot of mass, and then I try to make it as simple as possible. So how does it work in reality? So uh, on the left, on the left, hand, key, uh, left hand here, I show the uh, very typical linear mass of wave function optimization of the energy. And you see that uh, the convergence is very simple, but it's very nice. Basically, within 10 iterations, it already converges. And then there's, and then, then it's just flat for this wave function, specific wave function. And if you zoom in here, and you said you see that there are some uh, fluctuations based on statistical uncertainty. And then this, uh, for the block linear method, I, here is a uh, another example. This is a uh, this is using a block linear method trying to optimize more than 20,000 wave function parameters. And if you do it for the uh, standard standard linear method, it's going to run out of memory. But block linear method, uh, with block linear method, we don't run out of memory. And instead, we, see, we still see the nice and simple convergence within a handful of, of uh, linear method iterations compared to the uh, to the uh, standard uh, no blocking linear method. All right, so uh, what can we compute once we have a good wave function? We can. This is the one example that we can compute the excitation energy uh, with a carbon fiber, and then this is the uh, uh, the comparison of excitation energy for using different method. And we see that the, uh, the equation motion couple cluster and the singles and doubles actually have a pretty large error compared to this error compared to full CI. So UMCCD, the error of UMCC is pretty large for these three states because they are actually doubly, doubly excited state. If you're quantum chemistry, you know that UMCC has, UMCC has, is pretty bad. Excuse me. It's pretty bad for double excited state because it doesn't have the, uh, the flexibility to relax the orbitals for double excited state. But our, uh, the excited state, the linear method, the linear method optimization with the excited states using this uh, multi-slater Jasper wave function with only like 50, 50 uh, like uh, with only 50 determinants can get us to a really accurate result compared to the standard quantum chemistry method upon optimization. And then uh, the point that I really want to make here is that with less than 100 variables, this method is already 
this wave function, uh, this wave function optimization estimate is already going to get to the error within one, one EV of QZDM or G and SCI QMC, which apparently contains millions and thousands of wave function parameters. So that basically means if you have a good enough wave function, the compact wave function, and a good enough wave function optimization technique, you don't really need that many of wave function variables to get the, the to, uh, to compute to get the properties, actual prediction of the properties that you want. All right. So uh, yeah. So the next question is how how do we actually use uh, inner method or broad inner method in QMC time? It's actually very extremely simple to use. The wave function uh, optimization is can be uh, all uh, built in this block. It's called loop, and then you use this, this max number. This max is, is uh, you use it like uh, yeah, you, you, spec you specify how many steps you want to run in this max number here. I specify this ten linear method steps, and then uh, be safe to to make sure you have convert you probably uh, need to run like uh, twenty or thirty something. And then uh, you have to specify linear method here in the QMC method, and then you, you need to use the adaptive shift, like, like, like I just described. It's going to automatically adjust the shift value in the, uh, in the optimizer. So you, you need to specify the adaptive in the main method keyword. And then there are additional few parameters of linear methods. The first one is to stay entirely excited state. It's going to determine whether you're going to just optimize the energy or you're going to optimize the excited state target, the big omega. And then, you, of course, if you want to do the big omega stuff, you need to set an uh, omega. Uh, uh, yes, the energy shift used to target different excited states. And you also need to set, you need to set the alpha and beta shift, which which is this shift I is the identity shift, this is the alpha shift, and the shift S is the overlap shift, the beta shift. And my experience is, uh, is that based on my experience, setting the shift to one is going to be a uh, pretty decent initial one. And then there's also a max parameter change value. This is the maximum, this is the maximum allowed parameter update. As I said, linear method only works if the parameter change are small. So uh, by setting a large uh, maximum parameter change here, it's going to reject all the parameters change that is that exceed that exceed this, this value. And there are two additional uh, parameters called chase noise or chase choice. The chase, because we use a iterative solver, uh, the Davidson method to solve the general like eigenvalue problem. Um, this chase noise basically has, tells you whether to chase the noise always to stay with the lowest eigenvectors in the iterative solver. And this is the default one. I, I think that for the most cases, you should just use the default one. And if you really uh, uh, run into some of the root splitting, a uh, really serious root splitting problem, bad root splitting problem, you can, uh, you can switch back to the chase closest, close, close, which uh, tends to stay uh, closest to your initial guess in the uh, iterative solver. But in most cases, the chase always is going to work well enough. Okay, so uh, in order to use block linear method, there are four additional parameters. Of course, to turn it off, to switch to block linear method, you need to, specify, you need to uh, set this block LM to yes. And then you also need to set uh, how many number of blocks you want to divide your wave function parameter into. That is specified by the and block and blocks parameter. And then this two, uh, this uncapped is how many number of eigenvectors you want to keep, that you want to keep per block in the block linear method, and then this NO is how many number of old, uh, previous or old updated vectors that you're going to use to, to account for interblock coupling in the block linear method. So the rule of thumb is that the block linear method should be turned on when the number of parameters exceed 5,000. And once you, once you have more than 5,000 away from the parameter, linear method tends to have memory troubles. So you should switch to, to block linear method. And my limited experience tells me that usually a few hundred of blocks and a handful uh, of these two of these two parameters, like five or something, is going to uh, uh, is going to be sufficient to uh, to balance memory and accuracy. The coefficients in the null is in the same block during the run. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the question? The coefficients that you are optimizing they all remain in the same block during the run, or they mix. Uh, the, so there are interblock couplings. Uh, there are interblock couplings accounted for by these uh, previous update directions. So the coefficients we optimize are in the same block, but they, they actually know the presence of other parameters in other blocks. Know it iteratively. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah. So what uh, the type of parameter the linear method or broad linear method can optimize? It's basically everything. 
The linear method is not going to do, or block linear method is not going to care whether the parameter is, uh, is linear or it's not linear. And it's, in the future, it's, not, it's also not going to care whether the parameter is real or complex. So this means that uh, we can modify stressor factors, orbital rotation parameters, CI vectors, and then presumably black back law of a wave function parameter. So everything uh, in the PMC can basically be uh, optimized uh, with linear method or block linear method. All right, so uh, this is pretty good. And then this is uh, just a simple kind of example of output of what linear method is going to output for you. Uh, this the first step of linear mass output is the initial wave function, um, the initial wave function statistics. So it's going to uh, output the energy is LE mean, the energy of the initial wave function without any <coughs> optimization, and it's going also going to optimize this L, uh, the square, uh, the mean of the square of the wave function. So I just put it there. And then the, this is the statistical uncertainty of the wave function, the auto correlation time, and if you're doing a uh, if you're doing the state targeting, the exact state targeting, you also, uh, is also going to output the target function, the big omega value, and the statistics, the statistics of the target function value. This is pretty simple. And the next step is to solve the generalized eigenvalue problem. Uh, in terms of the QNC pack, we use a Davidson solver to solve the generalized eigenvalue problem, an iterative uh, solver, and it's going to print out uh, the information of each iteration of Davidson solver. It's going to print out the current eigenvalue, the current residue, and then also some information about uh, whether the whether you are, are whether your cradle space becomes becomes a linearly dependent or not. And if you're not interested in this one, but this most important in this part is that it's also going to output the largest weight on the derivative vectors for a specific shift. So this is the kind of this is a parameter change that you have for a specific shift. And here you see the parameter chain is like 0.9, which exceeds, exceeds our uh, previous uh, pre-assigned uh, the maximum allowable parameter chain, which is 0.3. This, this update is going to be rejected because it's too large, and then the first order pair expansion breaks. And the next step, uh, step three, is that it's going to do a correlative correlate sampling to compare uh, these uh, the updated direct the updated wave functions based on these different shifts. So this this is uh, this is nothing but the initial wave function, and these are the three shift uh, wave function value, uh, three, uh, three updated wave function value of three different shifts. And you see that um, you, can, you can see it clearly. This one actually is the best. Uh, it gets the lowest target function value. It shrinks the variance by almost a factor of two. So this one uh, this one presumably wins. And whether it wins is the next slide. And the last step is that it's going to tell you which uh, what the link, what the optimizer is going to do. So we have, uh, it's going to output the shift value and the maximum parameter change of that shift, and the cost function value, which can be the energy or the, uh, the big omega, and then it's going to choose which one is going to be used. So in this case, the first, the smallest shift is a bad shift, it's a bad update because it exceeds the maximum allowed of parameter change. So it's, it's going to be rejected, and the middle shift, and then these, uh, comparing these two, this one actually wins because they got a lower uh, cost function value. And then marked by this error, the, uh, the optimizer is going, to, is going to take the update predicted by this shift. And then starting uh, from starting from uh, starting from the next iteration, uh, the wave function will be updated based on uh, this parameter change. All right, so. Uh, so there are some upcoming features, optimization features in QNC pack, but now the student not done yet in uh, developing this uh, the optimizer. The most important one is this compact wave function is that to give the uh, the optimizer the ability to optimize complex wave function parameters, so that we can really deal with complex orbitals coming out of like a like uh, coming out of like a solid state calculation in quantum espresso, like in plan in terms of plan waves. So this is uh, we're actually working on getting this done. And there are also, there are also other features like guiding functions. So currently, the guiding function that we use to sample, uh, to sample to compute matrices are nothing but the wave function itself. But in some cases, we found that it's not sufficient to use the wave function itself to sample the, the matrix, to sample the matrices. Because matrices is just a wave function. <coughs> Sometimes the wave function have significant but different statistics. Then it's derivative, so it's not going to be sufficient to sample the derivative with the wave function. In that case, we have implemented a few different, uh, a different guiding function which deal with that problem, and but it's not in the develop branch uh, right now. We're trying to push it to the develop branch. Hopefully, it's going to, re going to be released. 
And this is going to help us deal with some really hard problems of optimization, like hard, uh, like hard orbital optimization problems. And then the group is also actually working on getting this, this uh, working on this hybrid optimization techniques, which further reduces memory, the memory requirement of the, of the linear method. It's called the hybrid. The hybrid method combines block linear method and the gradient descent. The first of all, gradient descent uh, method, which and then, so this idea is basically that I do a few gradient descent steps, and then I do one step of block linear method. Because gradient descent is really memory cheap, this one is going to save you, still, going to save you a lot of memory compared to either the standard, uh, standard linear method or the uh, block linear method. And then we can really do some of the large systems uh, of the way function optimization. And uh, we have some, we also have some hands-on examples in the, uh, in the, in the hands-on session. Three example, the first one is the energy optimization of all electron H4. This gives you some true idea of how the optimizer works. Very simple system can be run, can run really fast the, with the gesture multi-station wave function or the orbital optimization. And the next one is to give you some sense of how the excited state, the big omega optimization works. So the H2O is the water with the, still the same wave function. And then the third one is the, a, is the example of using block linear method optimization of carbon dimer. Uh, with only a handful of wave function parameters, because uh, in that case, in that case, in the case that simple, you should not really use a block linear method. But uh, it, this is just a just a simple example to give you some sense of how block linear method works. Because if you really want to use block linear method, then the wave function parameters should exist should be like tens of thousands, and it would take a day or so to to actually optimize it. Okay, so uh, yeah, so these are the references that I have. That I use to form these slides, and then if you are really interested in the theory <coughs> or the results uh, of linear method, block linear method, uh, hybrid hybrid stuff, then the, hy the hybrid optimization techniques, and how this uh, this all works for different wave function parameters, you are welcome to go uh, into to dive into these references. If you have a problem uh, in either in, in terms of reading these references, and or in terms of how to use. Uh, the also the broad the linear method or broad linear method optimizing change pack feel free to email uh, the group is me or Eric or other group members. Uh, as uh, we ha I have to mention that wave function optimization is is not an easy uh, as easy as I said you can't just hit a button and let it go it can be tricky sometimes uh, you can end up in local minimum and then sometimes you you, uh, you have to tweak your initial guesses you have to change the parameters so there are a lot of Things that can tune in the event to get to the right answer. So if you have if you have any questions, feel free to email uh, the group. Hopefully we can, uh, we can help you. Yeah. So uh, the last one I'd like to thank Eric uh, for the uh, for the excellent mentorship during my PhD. Also, I'd like to thank the Newscommand group and then my collaborators in the CMS Center, especially Yeah, for a lot of help in the code development. Also, I'd like to thank uh, funding from uh, UC Berkeley, Department of Energy, and then, uh, yeah, UC Berkeley, Department of Energy. And thank uh, all of you for your attention. Is there any questions? Uh, so you said it doesn't matter if the parameters are nonlinear yes. either. So can we currently optimize cutoffs for Jastra right now? Uh, no, currently it's not implemented. I think the plumbing is simply not there, but okay. it, it could be added if so there's another demand. Yeah. 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 So you, you displayed a number of control parameters for the optimization process and gave some typical recommendations yes. for them. Uh, do any of those parameters depend on system size? If you're going to go to larger and larger systems, would you need them to tune them differently? Uh, I don't think so. I should. Uh, I don't. It's depending on how hard the optimization is. You, so. So this, if you have a hard system set, you can still end up with simple optimization, like all the parameters are linear. And even sometimes you have small optimization, like system is small, but a lot of like nonlinear parameters. So that optimization tends to be harder than the uh, larger simple optimization. So it's not going to depend on how hard the system is. It's more or less, it's more or less going to depend on how hard the optimization is. Yeah. Uh, is there any intrinsic way that you deal with uh, degeneracy in the optimization? Say you want to do orbital rotation, you accidentally put in two orbitals that are almost the same. Uh, would the optimizer run into trouble there? So you mean you end up with a linear dependency? Yes. Uh, the group of the uh, block linear, the uh, linear method is going to. Uh... Uh, 
So, so the, re the, the thing that we uh, we set up this this iterative solver is to remove that, is to eliminate that problem. So it's going to see, it's going to uh, tell you whether your subspace becomes linearly degenerate. If you, I think if you end up with two parameters of linearly degenerate, and then uh, this value, the smallest singular value of the subspace is, is going to become like almost zero. And then uh, the optimizer is going to stop and tell you that you run into a linear dependency problem. You should either stop there or check, go back to check away function to eliminate any of the linear dependency, or you should uh, just use whatever the best you have with the uh, iterative optimizers. I remember at least in the original linear method that was very really sensitive to the amount of the statistics that you had. Uh, is there any systematic way to know how much you need to collect to have a small enough errors in the overall matrix so everything works at the end? Uh, one thing, can, can you repeat the question, please? Because I can't hear it on the Yeah, the question is the linear method is kind of sensitive to the statistics uh, to how many samples we have. If you have, don't have enough samples, the, the noise in the, in, the, uh, in the matrices are large, and you do not have really good wave function update directions to you using that noisy matrices. <laughs> One thing you can do is to increase the number of samples and then plot, uh, and then plot the, uh, the statistics of the matrix element to see whether it's, uh, it's nicely Gaussian, it's, have small, uh, uh, it's nicely Gaussian, and how large the statistical error is. And then if you are uh, satisfied with that, if you're not satisfied, you can keep increasing, uh, keep increasing the, uh, the sample size, or you can use, uh, you can use this uh, different type of guiding functions. Really, this really helps with the statistics, but it's not currently in the development branch. So the only thing that I would recommend is to increase number of samples and then plot the statistics of the matrix elements. Sure. So this is a related uh, question and comment. Uh, so the statistics of the matrix elements are are one thing, but it'd be nice to be able to know something about the statistics on the computed parameters. So have you thought about doing anything like uh, Jackknife or bootstrap resampling, where you actually could put error bars on the on the actual calculated parameters to know whether you are, have very much information about them. That might help guide the sampling further. Mm, that's a uh, excellent comment. I we haven't uh, done anything in that direction. Uh, I tried that type of thing. So doing basically at every step, Kumsi pack will spit out the parameters since you are uh, um, optimizing it. So you can take out those parameters and do average to increase the fidelity of the optimized uh, uh, parameters, especially towards the end of the optimization. Then one comment to Fernando's question. So basically, uh, at the beginning of the optimization, you are far from, away from the uh, ground state. Actually, like doing just optimization, you can do it very, very cheap. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you can operate with very few amounts of statistics. At the range of convergence, actually, you might notice that the steps, the optimization steps, the VMC energy will fluctuate. So basically, the optimization accuracy could, I, my experience is roughly the same as your VMC error bar. That's the comparison. So you, if you want to push more accuracy, you need to make sure every BMC block reaches certain accuracy. Then the optimization is mostly at that accuracy. Uh, one last question before the break. Anyone? Okay, so this is a question that just to understand exactly the quality that you get after optimizing. I mean, imagine if so you are optimizing your orbitals, yes. you are rotating them. Yes. Uh, in presence of just rows, uh -huh. then I take away the new coefficients, and I put them back in the code that is just going to try to find again some energy, and we're just going to do one cycle as yet. Am I going to find that this is a better state in general, or these coefficients are better, or am I going to fall back to something higher because these orbitals are not giving me a lower state? So you take the orbitals and do... So you rotate them, you optimize yes, them, yes, yes. then I put them back in an SCF. Mind, you I put them aware. back in the Hartree fog SCF? Yeah, I'm aware that because of the Hartree fog does not have the Jastros anymore, we are introducing correlation from the Jastros, this might... But what is your feeling about them? In the sense, uh, are you sure that these orbitals are physically better? 
They're physically better in terms of the in the presence of gastro. So if you remove that, do you have a feel if they are, are you doing better or is it really just the rule that they are getting better because the gastros are there and you're just basically adapting them? So, so depending on how we define the orbitals that being better, if, if they're saying that the orbitals, the best orbitals are orbitals that give the best SCF energy, then these orbitals are certainly not better. Okay. That's, that's yeah, and they're also not the natural orbitals, right? So it's going to be system dependent, but probably worse, almost certainly worse. All right, thanks very much.